Okay, Sergeant, would you please start your recordings? According to PC has started. Recording to the cloud, all set. Backup is rolling. Okay. Sergeant Sadowski, you may begin with your opening statement. Thank you and good morning and welcome to today's remote New York City Council hearing of the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts, jointly with economic development. At this time, would all council members and council staff please turn on their video. To minimize disruption, please place electronic devices on vibrate or silent mode. If you wish to submit testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.myc.gov. Once again, that is testimony at council.myc.gov. Thank you, we are ready to begin. Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Chair Justin Brannan, uh, Chair of the Committee on Resiliency and Waterfronts. And I'd like to thank you for joining us today for our virtual hearing, uh, a joint hearing with Council Member Vallone and the Committee on Economic Development. Uh, before I read my opening statement, I want to acknowledge uh, some of my colleagues who have joined us so far. Uh, Council members Ku, Powers, Lewis, Rose, and Joni. Uh, and I will acknowledge others as they join in this morning. Um, thank you all for being here this morning. Um, today's hearing is on port safety and resiliency in the five boroughs, which is something that is very, very important to all of us out here, especially outside Manhattan in the so-called outer boroughs. Uh, as you all know, yesterday we celebrated Earth Day uh, and today we continue to demonstrate our commitment to protecting our environment by discussing resiliency measures planned and ones that must be implemented to address climate change. As a city surrounded by water and with 520 miles of coastline, our ports and low-lying neighborhoods are particularly vulnerable to the impacts of sea level rise, storm surge, and high tide and sunny day flooding. Superstorm Sandy cost the city nearly $20 billion. And if we do nothing, future extreme weather events could cost the city $90 billion in damages by 2050. That's less than 30 years from now. Building resilience is an ongoing process. It is therefore imperative that we continue to protect our ports, our marine terminals, and our food distribution centers, as well as our residents and our property. In January, Governor Cuomo announced plans to develop two new offshore wind farms off the coast of Long Island to transform the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal in Sunset Park into a large scale offshore wind staging and assembling facility. The terminal will become one of the largest dedicated offshore wind port facilities in the country, bringing much needed green infrastructure jobs right here to Brooklyn, investing in the Sunset Park community and helping us move one step closer to our renewable energy goals. I look forward to hearing from the Economic Development Corporation this morning about this important project and working with the administration to help ensure its success. The Hunt Point Food Distribution Center in the South Bronx is a vital food hub, distributing over 2 billion pounds of food throughout the city annually. It's also located on a low-lying peninsula that is vulnerable to storm surge and power outages. Because Superstorm Sandy hit the city at low tide, the food distribution center at Hunt's Point was spared. But because of Hunt's Point's, Hunt Point's vulnerabilities, the city convened a working group in 2015 to come up with ways to ensure that this critical food distribution hub would be protected against future coastal threats. The working group recommended that the city should focus on both coastal protection measures and elevating and protecting the mechanical systems and installing backup power uh, generation. Building equipment has been hardened, but no coastal protection measures have been put in place at Hunts Point. So I look forward to hearing from EDC and the Mayor's Office of Climate Resiliency today on what coastal protection measures are planned and what else is necessary to ensure that such a vital part of our city's food supply and the Hunts Point neighborhood itself is both protected and resilient. East Harlem is also a low-lying neighborhood, highly susceptible to flooding from storm surge and sea level rise, as well as extreme heat. 
In 2017, the city hired consultants to study how best to protect East Harlem from the future effects of climate change. The study found the cost of an action in the face of climate change over the next 50 years would be approximately $3.2 billion. As a result, in December 2019, the Mayor's Office of Climate Resiliency and the Parks Department released a vision plan that highlighted the need to better manage stormwater, develop and renovate open spaces to be more resilient, create cool streets and public spaces to reduce the urban heat island effect, as well as elevating waterfront edges to reduce neighborhood flood risk. The study and vision plan served as a framework for developing a stronger, safer, and more resilient East Harlem. Since the vision plan was released more than a year ago, we wanna hear what steps the city has taken to make East Harlem more resilient. As part of the East Side Coastal Resiliency Plan, an integrated flood protection system will be constructed from Montgomery Street to East 25th Street in Manhattan. Coastal protection and resiliency measures are critical to protect the, sounding, the, 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 the surrounding neighborhoods from coastal storm surge events and the resultant devastation like what was caused by Superstorm Sandy. This project must be done with transparency and we must ensure that residents continue to have access to green space, parks and playgrounds throughout the construction process. The city must also ensure that it openly communicates with residents about the status of the Staten Island seawall, a 5.3 mile long seawall between Forts Wadsworth and Oakwood Beach on the east shore of Staten Island. This seawall, originally expected to be completed in 2021, now likely will not be completed until 2026 because of continuous construction delays. Staten Island cannot afford to be without coastal storm protection when the next storm hits. The committees today will also hear proposed intro 1679A sponsored by my colleague, Chair Vallone, who will speak more about his bill in a moment, which would require the city to study all shoreline protection structures and incorporate living shorelines and nature-based features where feasible. We look forward today to hearing from the Mayor's Office of Climate Resiliency and the Economic Development Corporation in today's hearing. Before we begin, I wanna thank my committee staff, Committee Counsel Jessica Steinberg-Alvin, Senior Policy Analyst Patrick Mulvihill, Senior Finance Analyst Jonathan Seltzer, my Chief of Staff Chris McCright, my Deputy Chief Kayla santos Suoso, as well as all the staff for the Economic Development Committee for all their hard work behind the scenes and putting this hearing together. Uh, I will now turn it over to my colleague, uh, Chair Vallone, for his opening remarks. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Chair Brennan. Today is a good day. We have a lot of happy people today. Uh, when we're talking about reviewing entire city shorelines and how we can protect and preserve them the day after Earth Day, that's a good day. So good morning, everyone. Uh, I am Paul Malone, Chair to the Committee on Economic Development, and we just heard from my good friend and fellow uh, Chair, Chair uh, Justice Brennan for the Resiliency and Waterfronts Committee for our joint hearing today. I believe it's our first one, so it's another part of a good day. Today's hearing will take a broad look at our city's ports and shoreline and how we are prepared for the impacts of climate change. As Chair Brennan just mentioned, the city's 520 miles of waterfront are particularly vulnerable to sea level rise and storm surge. At the same time, we are utilizing our waterfront areas for important needs like maritime freight distribution, transportation, housing, public parks, and more. We must balance this need to make use of our shoreline for vital activities with the need to ensure our shoreline and the structures on it are resilient enough to withstand the effects of climate change. During this hearing, we'll be looking at how the administration, particularly EDC and the Mayor's Office of Climate Resiliency are working on that balance. We'll take a look at ongoing resiliency projects such as the East Side Coastal Resiliency Project, the Staten Island Seawall, the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, offshore wind projects, and others. This hearing will also provide an opportunity to revisit oversight topics we have covered in the past and look how the admin is addressing resiliency in those areas. For example, in 2018, the EDC held a hearing on Freight NYC, EDC's $100 million initiative to modernize the city's freight network and shift a significant portion of freight movement from trucking to maritime and light rail distribution. We want to take a look at how Freight NYC and long-term resiliency issues are progressing. 
The committee has also held an oversight hearing on the Hunts Point Food Distribution Center in the Bronx, a key vital hub in the city's food distribution network. Due to its location, Hunts Point also faces risk of flooding and power outages from storms, and future planning must take these risks into account. And last but certainly not least, we will hear a piece of legislation sponsored by myself that will help the city take a comprehensive look at the protective structures of its shoreline and evaluate what needs to be maintained or improved. This bill proposed introduction 1679A will require the mayor to designate an agency to conduct this study of the shoreline of all shoreline protective structures in New York City. The agency would then be prepare recommendations for maintaining shoreline protection structures that are functional for replacing those structures that are deteriorating and for adding shoreline protection structures where they do not exist. Recommendations will include using living shoreline techniques or environmentally responsible alternatives to traditional concrete material where feasible. And the report will be submitted to the mayor and the council and be publicly available online. For example, in my district, we are surrounded by water on three sides out here in Northeast Queens, all the way from City Field out to Long Island. It is a very large uh, district that has shoreline all the way from College Point, Whitestone, Little Neck, and Douglas. But we don't have a clear picture of what shoreline structures are there and what state they are in and in no way to access the waterfront in my areas. And there are many groups in College Point, like the Coastal Preservation Network, that, have been, that were, came into existence just for that purpose. So my time as council member and chair of EDC is almost up, unfortunately, but I wanna make sure that the next committee chair and the next admin have a comprehensive understanding of the state of shoreline protection structures across this city. I hope this study can provide this base of knowledge that can help the next committee and admin manage the shoreline in many years to come. A lot of work has gone into the legislation of this size and I'm looking forward to discussing this bill with our representatives from EDC and MOCR, as well as the wide range of advocates who are uh, been cheering and here today. Before I turn it over, just want to take a moment to thank the committee staff, legislative councils Chris Satori, Jessica Steinberg, Al Jessica Steinberg, Alvin, policy analysts Emily Forgione and Patrick Mobile, and finance analyst Aliyah Ali, who has been by our side from day one for all their hard work for putting this together. With that, I'll turn it back over to our moderator. Thank you, Chair Brennan. Thank you, Chair Ballone. Um, it's great to chairing this important hearing with you today and hearing these important bills. Thank you for all your work uh, on this committee. I also want to acknowledge uh, Councilman Cornegie, who has joined us. And with that, I want to turn it over to our moderator, uh, the uh, Economic Development Committee Council, Chris Sartori, to go over some uh, procedural items. Thank you, Chair Brannon. I'm Chris Sartori, Counsel to the Committee on Economic Development, and I will be moderating this hearing. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that you'll be on mute until you are called on to testify, at which, at which point you'll be unmuted by the host. During the hearing, I'll be calling on panelists to testify, so please listen to your, for your name to be called as I will periodically be announcing who the next panelists will be. We will first be hearing testimony from the administration, followed by testimony from members of the public. During the hearing, if council members would like to ask a question of the administration or of a specific panelist, please use the Zoom raise hand function and I will call on you in order. We will be limiting council member questions to five minutes, which includes the time it takes to answer those questions. For members of the public, we'll be limiting uh, speaking time to three minutes in order to accommodate those who wish to speak today. Once you are called on to testify, please begin by stating your name and the organization you represent, if any. I will now call on representatives of the administration to testify. Appearing today for the Mayor's Office of Climate Resiliency will be Director Janie Bavishi. Appearing for the New York City Economic Development Corporation will be Julie Stein, Senior Vice President for Asset Management. Management. Andrew Gen, Senior Vice President for Transportation. Elijah Hutchinson, Vice President for Neighborhood Strategies. Prince Flanagan, Assistant Vice President for Design and Construction, and Jennifer Montalvo, Vice President, Government and Community Relations. At this time, I'll administer the affirmation to each representative of the administration. I will call on each of you individually for a response. So at this time, please raise your right hands. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Director Bavishi? Yes, I do. 
Thank you. Senior Vice President Stein. Yes, I do. Thank you. Senior Vice President Gen. I do. Thank you. Vice President Hutchinson. Yes, I do. Thank you. Assistant Vice President Flanagan. Yes, I do. Thank you. Vice President Montalvo. I do. Thank you. At this time, I'd like to invite Senior Vice President Julie Stein to present her testimony. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning, members of the council. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss port safety and resiliency in all five boroughs. My name is Julie Stein, Senior Vice President for Asset Management, and I'm joined by my colleagues from EDC, as well as from Jenny, with, uh, as, as well as Jenny Babici, Director of the Mayor's Office on Recovery and Climate Resiliency. Today, I will be providing an overview of the importance of our ports and waterfront to New York City and the regional economy and the essential functions that radiate from them. In this testimony, we will highlight some of EDC's projects as identified by the Council. I will also put this in the context of creating a sustainable and resilient future in the face of climate change, more frequent, powerful storms, and sea level rise. Let's look at why this topic is so important to New York City and why we are so focused on it. As we sit here, we are in a city made up primarily of islands and peninsulas. In fact, all told, New York City has 520 miles of waterfront, a mix of public and private land, developed and undeveloped, industrial uses in open space, as well as other uses. Approximately one third of the waterfront is privately owned. Water is what's made this city great. It's water that brought the first trading ships, which seeded the growth of the maritime industry and opened New York to become a global center of commerce. It's water that allowed us to distribute food from farms of state and across the country. And it's water that beckons us to take advantage of opportunities in green energy. In short, water is both our past and our future. The flip side of all of this, our waterfronts are vulnerable. They are subject to increased storm activity and the damage and loss of life it can bring. During Sandy in 2012, people died, homes were destroyed, subways shut down, and power outages darkened the city. We now know that by 2050, the city could experience 30% more extreme precipitation events, and on top of that, there looms a specter of sea level rise. Because of this, it is impossible to separate economic development from our focus on coastal resiliency, sustainable energy, and alternatives in transportation. The city established the New York City Panel on Climate Change, which takes international panel of climate change projections and localizes them to New York City, providing the latest and peer-reviewed climate data at the local level. With that research in hand, we at EDC are mapping our greatest vulnerabilities and taking bold and significant action to address them. The city is investing $20 billion in recovery and resiliency projects across the five boroughs, making it one of the most ambitious urban infrastructure programs in the United States. Strong ports are also key to our planning. They strengthen the city's resiliency in the face of emergencies and transportation disruptions. In order to lower carbon emissions, we are turning to multimodal freight transport by maritime and rail. With that, let's look at some of these major initiatives and how we support them. Through Freight NYC, EDC is helping New York City overhaul our aging freight distribution systems through strategic investments to modernize our maritime and rail assets, build new distribution facilities, and create thousands of well-paying jobs. As the city population grows and consumers demand near instant deliveries, local freight volume will increase an estimated 68% by 2045. And with trucks currently moving nearly 90% of freight, traffic will nowhere to go. The Freight NYC plan leverages these key strategic, sorry, these key strategies to support modal shift and reduce the share of freight moving by truck. We are updating port infrastructure at the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal to support offshore wind facilities and other project cargo. We are making access improvements to the city's largest container port at Staten, Staten Island's Howland Hook. In addition, we are forming partnerships with maritime firms and shipping companies to have more to move more freight by water and increasing rail freight to take pressure off our roadways. Crucially, we are doing this with a view to decarbonize the supply chain by using zero emissions vehicles and reducing truck miles traveled wherever possible. To give you examples, I would like to tell you how Freight NYC is investing in two freight hubs, the South Brooklyn Marine Terminal, or SBMT, and Hunts Point. SBMT and Sunset Park is undergoing a rebirth. The city initially invested over $115 million to reactivate SBMT as a major shipping hub to spur further development. SBMT is now our most prominent investment to support offshore wind production, and we will invest another $57 million in offshore wind-specific port improvements. Within the next few years, SBMT will support the production of 3.3 gigawatts of clean energy. This is in no small part thanks to the advocacy of Councilmember Menchaca, who has continually pushed for a strong maritime industrial use of the site. With our partners Sustainable SBMT and Equinor US, coupled with the support of federal and state governments and local leaders, 
SBMT will establish New York City as a wind industry hub, strengthen the local green economy, and create a national model to support offshore wind activity. We project over 1,200 jobs associated with the project while ensuring the local community in South Brooklyn has a direct pipeline to these opportunities through the creation of a $5 million fund to train workers in the skills they need to succeed in these jobs. Another major hub of freight activity is the Hunts Point Peninsula in the Bronx. Because Hunts Point is key to the local and regional food supply chain, EDC and the city are working with the local community to address vulnerabilities to disruption from future storms and other environmental threats. Hunts Point is home to 12,000 residents, 18,000 workers, and the Food Distribution Center, which is the largest such, in the, such center in the nation. The Food Distribution, or FDC, feeds the tri-state area with an estimated 4.5 billion pounds of food distributed every year, about half of which feeds consumers in New York City. 12% of all food distributed to New York City comes from the FDC. Using funding from HUD, we partnered with the community to, large, to launch the Hunts Point resiliency process. Through it, we found that different parts of Hunts Point face varying risks. The industrial area, sited in low-lying floodplain, is vulnerable to storm surge, flooding, power outage, and extreme heat. However, residential area, the residential neighborhood is at a higher elevation, subject to blackouts and heat issues, but not flooding. The study prioritized an energy resilience project, including a microgrid, solar power and energy storage, and backup systems for residents, schools, and the food distribution center businesses. In addition, we are working with the FDC tenants to develop specialized emergency operational response plans. And in the long term, we are committing to, committed to working with our FDC tenants on modernization plans to address coastal flooding risk. Each waterfront has its unique challenges. The historic heart of New York's waterfront is Lower Manhattan, another area that faces significant risks simply by its location. One of the largest central business districts in the country and one of the world's densest concentration of jobs, it's surrounded by water on three sides. This means if sea level rises to as much as six feet, which is what conservative models project, the neighborhood could be uninhabitable by 2100. As I mentioned, Hurricane Sandy forced the city to recognize its vulnerability. That is why the city is investing roughly $500 million in permanent infrastructure plans to safeguard Lower Manhattan's coastal areas and provide interim flood protection. The Lower Manhattan Coastal Resiliency Project involves four tailored initiatives to protect close to 70% of the coastline. We are examining how to extend the seaport and financial district shoreline into the East River to act as a flood barrier. In the neighborhoods between the Manhattan and Brooklyn bridges, we are designing a system of flood barriers. We also have plans to elevate the wharf and esplanade along the battery to, stre to strengthen the shoreline there. And we are coordinating with the Battery Park City Authority on the reconstruction of its waterfront esplanade. To support many of these freight and resilience initiatives, City EDC relies on our waterfront rehabilitation program. We wanna thank council member Valone for introducing intro 1679, a local law related to evaluating shoreline structures around New York City. We, leave, we believe this process is vital. And that is why EDC has led a waterfront rehabilitation program for more than two decades. This program is supported by two key components, waterfront inspections and waterfront capital construction. EDC inspects city owned waterfront infrastructure and provides repair recommendations annually. In addition, EDC works with a wide range of city agencies to identify the critical infrastructure that needs to be addressed. That means 40 to 50 sites per year and a $3 million annual inspection budget. The key deliverables from a typical inspection are a report that details recommended repairs and cost estimates for implementing the renovations. These deliverables are used to support capital construction planning by the city. Over the course of fiscal years 2018 and 2019, EDC performed 80 inspections that identified approximately $900 million in recommended repairs across 150 different waterfront infrastructure systems under the jurisdiction of agencies. Of that 150 systems, approximately 45% needed repairs within one to five years. The capital construction component of the program is responsible for developing the five to 10 year capital plans for waterfront infrastructure under EDC's jurisdiction. The most recent capital plan identified $250 million in rehabilitation needs for EDC assets. The waterfront facilities management, sorry, the waterfront facilities maintenance management system is available to help in decision making. This tool can be found on EDC's website. It has mapped the entire 520 miles of New York City waterfront and incorporates geospatial data and computer modeling to create detailed maps and other important waterfront data compiled from EDC inspection updates. This allows EDC, city agencies, engineers, maritime contractors, construction professionals, community stakeholders, and others to make efficient, better informed decisions when prioritizing waterfront assets or acting in emergencies. It also encourages greater, it also encourages greater interagency alignment. 
thank you so much for the opportunity to be here today. We're happy to take your questions. Thank you. And I'll now turn it over to Chair Brannon and Chair Ballone for questions. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I want to acknowledge as well my colleague, Councilman Lander, who has joined us. Um, just in case, uh, Justin, if we didn't mention that, we also have from the EDC committee, uh, Council Members Lewis, Joe and I, and Powers, who joined on from what I can see. Got it. Um, I want to just jump, ju jump into something I heard um, right off the bat. The, your testimony stated the city is investing $20 billion in uh, recovery and resiliency projects. Um, could you tell us what these projects will be and, and how, and really almost equally as important, how dependent they'll be on state and federal funding? Sure. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Janie Bibishi to uh, speak to that question about the citywide approach. Uh, thank you, Chair Brannon, for that question. Um, happy Earth Week. Um, uh, so yeah, the $20 billion that Julie mentioned um, are, are the um, $20 billion we have um, been working to invest in resiliency and recovery projects across the city um, since Hurricane Sandy. Um, about 15 billion of that is federal funding. It's all allocated. So um, we're not uh, counting on new federal funding um, when, we, when we cite that number. Um, and most of the remaining 5 billion is city investment. There's a little bit of state funding in the mix, but, um, uh, but not much um, in, the, in the grand scheme of things. Um, uh, I want to be clear that this is, um, I, I would see this as a down payment on resiliency investments across the city. Um, we, there's much more work to do beyond the $20 billion portfolio of projects we are advancing now. And um, we uh, are going to have to continue to be creative about how we finance that. I think there is, um, there's some promising um, uh, uh, there's promising progress on the horizon. Um, you know, the state passed the uh, New York Bond Act, or otherwise known as the Mother, Mother Nature Bond Act, um, in in the legislative session um, this year. That will go to ballots um, in the fall um, and can provide some much needed money for proactive resiliency action. And I think the um, uh, Biden administration's American Jobs Plan is also promising. There's a $50 billion allocation in there um, for resilient infrastructure. So we'll see how Congress takes that up. Okay. So you said it's 15 billion in federal funding, right? Is that right? Um, yes, sorry, I was muted. Um, yes, that's uh, approximately 15 billion in, in federal recovery dollars after Sandy. Okay. Can you give us a breakdown of the resiliency related projects in MOR's portfolio um, or, or projects at MOR overseas? And could you give us a breakdown by borough? Um, I'm sorry, Chair Brennan, I do not have that in front of me right now. I'm happy to follow up with your with your team about that. Yeah, we um, we requested in the hearings in October and November um, a breakdown of the projected cost of each resiliency related project, the agency funding for each project and how much has been spent on each project so far. Do you have that? Um, there are a lot of projects. There are literally hundreds of projects in the in the um, mix in the twenty billion dollar portfolio. So no, I do not have that um, at my fingertips now. But um, again, we're happy to follow up. Okay. Um, the uh, the block grant disaster relief money that the city was awarded for uh, coastal resiliency projects. I know it's got to be spent by. September 2022, um, or the city uh, risks losing that funding. So we've got about a year and a half to that deadline. Um, which projects have been prioritized to receive that funding? Um, so just a, a, a um, bit of a, a correction there. Um, so Congress actually acted to extend the deadline for the CDBGDR block dollars um, uh, to New York City to September 2023. Um, so uh, we do have a little extra time to spend that money. 
um, uh, in terms of which projects are prioritized, um, all of the projects that are funded with the CDBGDR um, dollars are priorities for us because we want to make sure that we spend that money and time. So that, I mean, they can't all be a priority. There has to be some sort of triaging happening, I assume. No, all of the projects that are funded with DR dollars are priorities. Um, we absolutely want to make sure that they move forward and they uh, and the money is spent in time. Um, okay. Uh, Hunts Point, 2019, uh, EDC committed to flood proofing, uh, flood proofing or hardening the most vulnerable buildings uh, in the food distro center there. Uh, there are a lot of people that claim that building hardening is really the bare minimum that EDC could do to protect uh, Hunts Point against flooding and that there should be more investment in coastal resiliency there. Is EDC studying uh, additional coastal protection measures at Hunts Point other than installing the backup power? Yeah, thank you for the question. So as we know that the energy continuity is the most pressing concern today for projecting our food supply center and based on co uh, current coastal risk that we think that a, a tailored approach to the at-risk buildings is the most appropriate and cost-effective response, not widespread coastal protection. Um, what we've been doing in the very short term is that uh, the, the, two, the facility that's at most at risk that is critical to our food supply is the Hunts Point, uh, the, meat the meat market up in Hunts Point. And those have the HESCO bags to deal with um, the short-term risks around flooding. The other, the other building that's in the floodplain is, is Crasdale, um, and they don't have, they don't provide any perishable goods, so um, they're part of a longer-term strategy. We have applied for the FEMA Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Program called BRIC, um, in order to effectuate additional building-level upgrades, and we're also committed to working with our tenants on longer-term modernization plans that will incorporate resiliency measures uh, that address long-term uh, coastal flooding. As you know, build, uh, buildings that are built to modern building code um, are, are resilient from coastal flooding, um, and so part of our investment more generally in the modernization of the food distribution center will address some of the coastal flooding risk. I mean, could you speak more specifically to, to other investments that are going to be made to protect Hunts Point? Certainly. So as you may be aware, there was announced, I believe, in 2015, um, $150 million investment in um, in Hunts Point uh, upgrades, and those are on a property by property basis. The, they're each in um, you know different states, depending on um, the property, but um, there are ongoing projects uh, you know, to, to think about modernization of the facilities more generally. For example, we just announced the groundbreaking a few weeks ago of the Grow NYC um, uh, uh, a facility up there, which will be built to modern building code and will be resilient to coastal flooding. But that's new construction, right? It's not for Correct. what's existing. Correct, but I, sorry, I think uh, as we continue to modernize the food distribution center with modern facilities, we will, con we will continue to, pr uh, to promote the coastal flood protection through, through those construction projects in addition to the FEMA grants that we're applying for, for hardening existing facilities. Okay, um, I, wanna, I wanna move through this so I can hand it over to my co-chair. Uh, Staten Island Seawall, uh, originally expected to be completed this year because of construction delays and disagreements between the city and state about who's responsible for removing hazardous waste materials that were discovered underneath the path uh, we're being told construction is now not in, expected to be complete by 2026. Um, what is the city's position as we stand today on who's responsible for removing this hazardous waste material? I'll ask the uh, mayor's officer of resiliency to take this question. Um, thanks for the question, Chair Brannon. So, um, uh, the, uh, the the hazardous waste is um, affecting one component of the project um, in the northern area of the project. And um, we had always had an understanding with the Army Corps of Engineers um, that the city would pay for the removal of the, the hazardous waste. Um, but um, our understanding was that the Army Corps would actually perform the work because of their deep expertise. 
piece um, in, in doing this kind of uh, remediation work. Um, just last fall, um, only months before we were supposed to go out to bid, um, the Army Corps said that they would not be able to perform that remediation work due to liability concerns. Um, the city, the state, and both uh, New York senators, Senator Schumer and Senator Gillibrand, agree that the Army Corps should do the work because um, there are just too many inefficiencies and technical challenges of having two different entities do the remediation work and then um, dig the trench for the, the levee and the flood wall. Um, so we have um, uh, all together, um, the se se uh, both senators, the state and the city have appealed to the Army Corps to uh, grant a policy waiver so that the Army Corps could go ahead and perform the work. The city is absolutely committed to paying for, for um, the remediation. I will though say that um, the other parts of the project are moving forward, parts of the project that are not impacted by the, the hazardous waste remediation. Um, and the Army Corps expects that they will break ground later this year. So is construction on the seawall happening right now as we speak? Um, there's not construction happening right now. Um, there is uh, design um, and, uh, and technical analysis happening. So we, um, the Army Corps, like I said, expects to break ground on other components of the project later this year. I mean, that's concerning because we thought it was going to be finished this year. And now we're saying we haven't even put shovels in the ground. Um, so, you know, I, I think this, this project has a long history. Our most recent expectation was that we would break ground early in 2021. Um, that timeline has been pushed back because of this uh, conflict around um, uh, who will perform the hazardous waste removal. Um, again, I'm sorry, is my information, I mean, I thought we were expected for it to be completed in 2021. You're saying we expected to put shovels in the ground in 2021. Like I said, this project has a long history and the, and the most recent timeline um, was that we would put shovels in the ground in early 2021. Um, uh, and, and, and we are expecting that, um, like I said, the Army Corps is expecting that we will put shovels in the ground in 2021, but that, that timeline has been delayed because it will be other components of the project that will move forward first, not the areas that are affected by the hazardous waste removal. Okay, um, I want to acknowledge uh, Council Member Barron who's joined us. Um, moving to the East Harlem Resiliency Project, um, 2019 MOR and Parks Department released a vision plan as I mentioned in my opening. Um, the city found that potential cost of not doing anything over the next 50 years would be uh, 3.2 billion. And a recent article I saw in the city uh, MOR stated that the vision plan uh, offered valuable insight into current and future risks uh, of East Harlem. Um, can you describe the risk that this neighborhood faces if we do nothing? Chair Brandon, if I could just interrupt for one quick second. If I could ask all the EDC panelists as well as, well as Director Bavishi to please stay unmuted for the duration of the Q&A. It's just there's some technical issues and then it'll make it easier for everyone. Uh, thank you. Thanks, Chris. Sure, um, yeah, thank you for the question. Um, uh, so East Harlem is a community that um, is uh, vulnerable to, to storm surge as well as um, uh, sea level rise and the impacts of intense precipitation. Um, the vision plan for Resilient East Harlem is publicly available and the Parks Department um, released it uh, to the public in December of 2019. And, and has the city effectuated any of those plans recommendations? Um, yeah, so there have been a couple of things that um, have been in, in the works and have been moving forward. Um, you know, we, um, my office has been clear that we're committed to continuing our engagement with East Harlem um, because we know that um, the risks of surge, extreme precipitation and heat will only grow worse. Um, in particular, um, uh, the Mayor's Office of Climate Resiliency successfully applied for a FEMA grant to study a water square concept project that would be designed to address the risks of extreme precipitation. Um, NYCHA and DEP has started work on the study. Um, they started work on the study last fall and it'll be completed by the end of the year. 
Uh, we're also working closely with parks as they implement the Harlem River Esplanade project and, and future Esplanade projects, as well as uh, Pier 107 to ensure resiliency is incorporated and community engagement is ongoing and, uh, in all of these projects. Um, and we're continuing to explore grant opportunities at both the federal and state level to look for new opportunities to further reduce risk in the neighborhood. Okay, that all sounds great, but has anything actually been done yet in these Harlem? Um, the, the projects that I have mentioned are moving forward um, and, uh, you know, uh, we, it's important to get design of these projects right to ensure resiliency is incorporated um, and that's what we're working on and engaging um, the community in that process. But nothing's actually physically tangibly been done yet. Um, I think of design moving forward as something get, being done, but no, there's no construction underway, if that's what you mean. So what's the timeline for when the people of East Harlem will actually see something get done? Um, you know, the Parks Department is leading on um, the Esplanade projects, and um, I am happy to have them follow up with your office to, um, uh, to provide those details. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm just hearing a lot of planning and designing, and I understand I'm not naive. I understand that all has to happen, but... I haven't heard of any any doing yet, anything that the average person walking down the street can actually see things changing. I haven't heard in any of these projects this yet, which is very concerning. And I haven't heard anyone blaming COVID for it either. So I don't know uh, what we're doing here. Um, last thing, and then I want I want to hand it over to uh, my, uh, my colleague, Councilman Vallone. The Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project Construction for this project is expected to continue through 2025. Uh, what flood protections are currently in place while the construction is, is ongoing? Um, you know, we evaluated um, the uh, Eastside Coastal Resiliency, the, the neighborhood that's protected by the Eastside Coastal Resiliency Project um, as a candidate for interim flood protection measures, but for many reasons that are very particular to that site, um, it, it didn't make sense to install interim flood protection measures in, in that particular neighborhood. Um, essentially, the interim flood protection measures would have only um, protected the park and would not have um, uh, effectively protected the community behind the park, which is really what we were concerned about. Um, so we are working to uh, move the Eastside Coastal Resilience Project as quickly as possible, and um, we expect that flood protection will be in place by the 2023 hurricane season. So the, the flood protection, you mean the permanent flood protection or the, the flood protection to protect the area as the project is, is ongoing? The permanent flood protection will be in place by, by 2023 hurricane season. And what green space will be provided for the community while the resiliency measures are constructed and, and the park is rebuilt? Um, you know, we heard the community's concerns about access to the park and so that therefore we've implemented a phased construction approach that allows for the community to access a part of the park at all times during construction. So what, so at no time will the entire park be closed? Um, no, there will be a part of the park that's open at all points in construction. And what's the plan for the Lower East Side Ecology Center? Um, I apologize, Chair Brennan. I don't have um, that information in front of me right now. I will follow up with your office about that. Okay, we have a lot of follow-ups here. I hope we're taking notes. Um, how many trees are being removed for the, the East Side Resiliency Project? Um, we will have to put this on the list of follow-ups. The Parks Department is really the best um, to uh, the best representative of the city to uh, answer that question. And I guess you don't know, if you don't know how many we're removing, you don't know how many are being replanted and replaced. That's a question for the Parks Department. Okay, and as of right now, is the East Side plan on time and within budget? Uh, yes, that's right. 
Okay. All right, I want to hand it over to uh, Council Member Vallone. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Brennan, and good morning, everyone. Um, Julie, thank you for your testimony and the EDC team and from the mayor's office, thank you for the information here. Um, it really does kind of flow into what Chair Brennan was doing on, a, on an overview of all these projects. And uh, I, I, like always, you're used to me by now, I always start with your testimony and, and the information that you've given us as my starting point. So I, I was brought immediately to page five where you give a, a pretty decent summary of inspection and what's happening. And I think that is what led to the bill in the first place because some of this is council members are aware of, aren't aware of. So why don't, why don't we start there? You, you state that um, there's over 500 miles of shorefront and over one third of that is privately owned. So we have two thirds of shoreline that, that the city is responsible for. And then you, you state that EDC inspects city owned waterfront infrastructure and provides repair recommendations annually. Is that done every year? Is that something that's, that's done? I know we do a five and a 10 year project. When was the last time EDC inspected the entire waterfront? Um, so thank you so much for the question. I'm going to turn the mic over to uh, my colleague, Prince Flanagan, who runs the, the program for EDC to give you details about the work that his team has been doing. Sure. sure uh, th thanks for the question. Uh, to answer this, uh, the specific question, um, yes, the, the program is currently active. Um, as of right now, we're in the process of inspecting different sites under the jurisdiction of different agencies um, across the five boroughs. Um, I think an important distinction to make um, is that uh, EDC performs the inspections um, and then we sort of hand off the capital planning to these other agencies to develop their own capital plans for their respective assets. Well, and that's where there's a lot of, not so much confusion, but there's a lot of interaction with the interagencies that you're working with. So could you kind of maybe give us a summary of that? So, so how many or what are the top three city agencies that you're working with in this process? So, but EDC is doing the inspection and then that inspection process is handed off to the applicable city agencies? Uh, correct. And the, the major, we work with a wide variety of agencies, but I would say the major agencies that we uh, work with are Parks Department, uh, DOT, uh, DEP, and, uh, and FDNY. But um, we, we reach out to, you know, uh, the, the different facilities and managers for each agency. And at the beginning of the fiscal year, we come up with um, scope of inspections and then we, you know, we implement them across the, the fiscal year. So how do you get, or how do you determine um, the work at that point? Is there a, a review or an accountability from those agencies back to you once the inspection is done? How do you know if it's been budgeted for, started or completed, which what Chair Brennan was talking about on certain projects? Right, so for the most part, um, EDC, uh, or at least my team, we um, are responsible for our own capital planning process for our own um, uh, uh, waterfront assets. We primarily leave it to the other agencies to uh, one, make the case to OMB to receive funding for their respective assets and then to prioritize um, which assets they're choosing to, to go for funding for. I, I think we just came up with another good bill. If you saw me, it was bringing in the background, which is requiring other sister agencies to give you an annual update on these resiliency projects that are within their capital and within their, even though you're identifying them, it's, it's, it's not so much that it's, it's concerning that there are city agencies out there who then take that information and are responsible for budgeting and getting it done. So you, but you also just said though that EDC does have its own capital projects for its own property. Why don't we talk about that? So how many, how many identifiable EDC projects are waterfront related at this point? Right. I don't have the specific number of, of assets, but I, I can tell you that the totality of the um, capital repairs that are needed across the different assets are about the, the 250 million that Julie mentioned over uh, approximately a five year period. Well, I mean, I, again, I'm, I'm, I'm always a stickler for testimony. So it, you guys have stated here that over the course of fiscal years 2018 and 2019, EDC has performed 80 inspections and have identified $900 million in recommended repairs across 150 different waterfront in, infrastructure systems. 
under the jurisdiction of, other, of the 150 systems, approximately 45% need repairs. And this goes back to a three-year-old study already. So we're already three years old in this particular three to four years. And we've only budgeted 250 of the needed 900. So we're already short, my math yeah. stinks, 700 million. I should, I, I think I should. Yeah, I think I should clarify the testimony and um, I'll let I'll let Prince chime in if I get this wrong, but the 900 million was across the, the program we had done for all city agencies. The $250 million was for the EDC waterfront assets that required rehabilitation. And that was comprehensive for what was identified as a need in from the previous year's programs. So yeah, that was, correct? Was, that, was that 900 million then of the 250 that EDC picked up that the other 700 million still get picked up by the other agencies to be? prioritized or is it still out there waiting to be done? I think for the most part, the respective agencies are still working through that process. I don't have specifics on uh, the level of progress for each agency, but I, I know that um, they're actively working to prioritize um, uh, what's important for, for their operational, operational needs. Well, I mean, this is where, see, we want, we want to team up, it's, it's budget season, right? So these are the things that those of us who are passionate about shoreline preservation, especially for, for myself and our district and the members that are present, uh, just about everybody these days, this is what we'd want to prioritize in budgets going forward. And when we have federal funding coming down and state and our own budgets, uh, being aware of the projects that still need to be funded, of the critical nature of the projects that you outlined today, those are some critical projects that the city needs. But then there are other projects that each one of the council members who have shoreline districts like myself and most of the Queens members who, who are still waiting for those not major tier projects to be tackled. And knowing where that budgetary process is, knowing where the study is, is, is what's leading to the bill today. And I'm glad, uh, I mean, I'll just ask you, it looks like in your testimony, you're supporting the bill. Am I correct on that? I, we are supportive of the intent, um, obviously, because we're already deeply engaged in this work, and we'd love to further discuss with council, um, you know, about the management system and, and how um, we can work with you to see how we can refine or improve it to better suit, suit the needs that you're seeking. Yeah, and I, I, I think that's, thank you for that. And I think that's pretty much where it's a matter of doing what you're kind of already doing, but expanding it and getting an annual report on that. I think we, I think we're going to have to Again, it's not just EDC's issue or problem. It is, is a city agency working together on this. So I think we're gonna need a, a companion bill or two that Chair Brennan and I could work out with some of the other council members to, to now marry in the other agencies on what is in their portfolio that EDC has outlined, where they are with that, what, what has been funded, what needs to be funded, what is yet to be targeted um, on that. Could you give us a description of once, and I'll use this, of this 900 million, once these repairs are determined, how do you determine which projects to go forward with? Right, that's a good question. Um, Thank you. <laughs> it's based on mul multiple factors. Um, one factor, for example, is if a specific asset has a high volume of you know, folks going back and forth across maybe a bulkhead or or whatever the case may be, um, we, we might prioritize based on that because in those cases, there, there's an immediate life safety risk if, if something collapses. And you have, so just go, I'll go with you step by step. So do you have a breakdown of those high risk projects that are within the city? Correct, we do. I don't have the information offhand, but it's something we have in our uh, management tool that- So you can provide that to us. So at least we can see which ones are being prioritized as a high, not so much risk, but the high priority to get to. Correct. Right. And so what would be the next level? Um, I would say that that's, 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 the, that's the major criteria. I mean, there's, there's different, obviously there's different tiers of activity. Um, and if, if we wanna be very nuanced, another um, criteria is just the physical level of deterioration of the asset. For example, if something might be severely deteriorated with um, a relatively small amount of activity, we might still rate that as just as significant as something with a moderate level of deterioration with a high level of activity because the, the impacts are, it, it really comes down to a life safety risk and we, we wanna make sure that it's, uh, we're not um, allowing um, these assets to deteriorate to the point where um, it's hurting anyone 
So you, you does so does EDC maintains that that breakdown of those type of projects? Is that done on an annual basis, or because it looks like the last one was done 2018, 2019, or just that was used as example? Correct. 20, 2018 and 2019 was used as an example. Um, during 2020, the program was paused for a few months because of COVID. Um, so for the um, for the more, for most part, we are playing a little bit of catch up now to you know finish up some of the inspections that were supposed to happen in 2020, um, and then um, acquire those inspection reports and work with the agencies to develop the, the next round of um, uh, capital repairs. Do we, can you provide a list of those requested inspection sites so that the council members are aware of which areas in their districts are being inspected for, for deterioration issues? Sure. Are you referring to the current? current? Yeah. So you're current. I mean, I think yes. the way yes. for us to kind of tackle this going forward is to, you're already doing base, basically the work. It's a matter of of now providing this information annually to, to beyond just EDC and the agencies, but now to, to all of us so we can prioritize what needs to be done and, and, and what needs to be prioritized. So with the, with the projects that are prioritized, are you just repairing them back to their original state? Part of the bill we're looking for is, is now trying to take in this quote, living shorelines approach where we can have a new green resiliency approach to projects that are maybe coming or to replace existing cement-based projects. Um, is any of that done with, with the repairs now or is that only for new future projects? Right, so for the most part, the, the kind of the mantra for the program is um, uh, repair in kind, unless there's specific circumstances um, um, that was discussed with you know, a specific agency or internally within EDC. Um, I think that if we were to kind of expand the program to address some of the uh, needs in the bill, we'd have to work through some of the current constraints of the program. Um, and we're, I think uh, we're happy to, happy to do that. Well, I think that that's part of what's in this bill. And I think that's why there's excitement here. It's, it's, it's a review of the shorelines and how we can use some of these new living resiliency techniques that are being brought in across the country in the, in the city, because we, we just don't want to put back, we want to repair, but there's opportunity for so many untouched parts of the shorelines. Um, of the two thirds of the shoreline that EDC maintains, do you have, uh, do you have a study of all existing two thirds land or is that just done on a repair need basis? So just to clarify, the two thirds are publicly owned more generally, not just in EDC's jurisdiction. So do you, do you expect that the entire, what's within your portfolio or is it only done on projects that are flagged that need, that need repairs? Uh, could you repeat the question, sorry. When you do the inspections that are in the report, is it the entire portfolio of EDC owned, city owned land or is it just at sites that need or are brought to your attention that need repair? Right, so it's it's typically sites that are in critical critical condition and need repairs. We try to inspect every site on roughly a roughly five year basis. But yeah, it's, it's also not. as a there's also another effort I want to highlight, which is that that waterfront ma maintenance management system also has mapping and visibility on each of the sites, even if they're not doing the deep dive inspection. So I don't know, Prince, exactly. if you want to get, get, explain the kind of information that's available for the sites that aren't getting the annual inspections. Exactly. So yeah, uh, thanks, Julie. It's good to separate kind of the inspection from the mapping. As of right now, we have the entire uh, entirety of the 520 miles of um, NYC waterfront mapped. That's available on the on the management tool. As for the inspections, it's it's um, something we're still working working towards to cover the entire waterfront. So uh, Council Member Bill, and I think that some of the information that you're interested in, in terms of understanding the conditions and the materiality of each of those miles might be available, even if a deep dive inspection hasn't been completed in the past few years. Well, I mean, so how are we to know then which part, which projects EDC is going forward with on an, a capital annual basis? I mean, other than the ones that Chair Brennan and I have targeted the major ones for today, do you have a list of projects that are on EDC's basically to-do list that are gonna be funded and go ahead with? We do. So. So can we share that list? What's what are we what's on target for for this year, or what's on target? What's coming up? So that's what we that's what we're trying to find out. The giving over that type of information is then allows us to fight with 
everyone and fight for the budget to, to allocate this. Otherwise, it's just all great things to be done. But if we don't have the budget for it, it's not going to get done. Yeah, like I said, what is the list that EDC has targeted to be done for, like you said, of your critical projects? It, it really is a number of sites. So I'm glad to share that list um, afterwards, but I, I don't have the list offhand uh, right now. And is that done on an equitable basis, borough by borough, or is it just done by need? The, the, the principal um, nature of the program is that we, you know, we target areas that are in deterioration and have high levels of activity. So, um, not necessarily um, based on a specific borrow, but I'm glad to share like specific criteria with you at a later. Well, I, you know, I see a chair, we've already been, I, we have council members on, I see council member Lander, and I see some other council members. I, I think what maybe we can do at this point is turn off, a turn to the council members maybe for some specific questions on either projects in their district that they may have. And then chair Brennan and I will come back because I have, additional questions about these larger projects, where we are with them and how we are going to uh, incorporate um, the work that's being done here. You've already identified over uh, 90, uh, the, the, the 900 million with only 250 million being targeted with city agencies that we don't know if that's even being done or not. So that's a uh, concerning to me coming into a, a budget season um, when we are, that's a three-year-old estimate that we're 700 million behind. We are a COVID pandemic uh, world now and we are already looking at new resiliency techniques that are not even in that 900 million. So uh, we have got some serious budgeting and, and work to be done to protect our shoreline. So Chair Brennan, I'll turn back to you to see if there's council members who have their hands up or a committee council. Do we have any council members at this point wanna jump in? Yeah. Uh, yes, chairs. There, there's, uh, there is a member who has a question. Um, just quickly before we move on to that member, I will just go through a quick spiel. We'll call on other members to ask their questions in the order they have used the Zoom raise hand function. Council members, if you'd like to ask a question but have not yet used the Zoom raise hand function, please raise it now. Uh, council members, please keep your questions to five minutes. The sergeant at arms will keep a timer and will let you know when your time is up. And please begin once I've called on you and the sergeant has announced that you may begin before asking your questions. At this point, we have council member Barron who has a question. Time starts now. Council member, please pause for a second. I think you're on mute. Okay. Can you hear me Just now? Give us one second to unmute you, please. We can hear you. Uh, yes, council member, you can begin. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, glad to be able to participate. I did not hear most of the testimony. So my questions may uh, already be about areas that you've already spoken about. Uh, so please forgive me. I represent East New York, which has waterfront at the, uh, the Jamaica Bay. During Hurricane Sandy, water came into one of those inlets and went to the western side and flooded into Canarsie. Had it gone to the eastern side, it would have flooded an area where there are, there's a development that's called the landings. The people who are at the landings, which are condominiums and co-ops, have indicated that their shoreline is eroding. We are having lots of challenges to find out, in fact, where their property line ends and where Parks Department, which I believe is the entity that uh, is responsible for the actual area that uh, comes in contact with the water begins. What would be the most efficient way to identify precisely where that ends? Because it's elevated at this point where the uh, property line is and there's a steep drop and the property line, the owners are saying that their property is being undermined. And it's obvious when you look at their porches and backyards that it's being, uh, there is a depression that's happening. First of all, how are we going to determine precisely who is responsible. And certainly we don't wanna to go to that property line and say, well, it's not yet there. So we don't have to worry about it. There has to be something proactive and preventive 
that parks department should be able to do to make sure that this property uh, is not endangered. Um, thank you for the question, Council Member Barron. Um, I um, uh, am not familiar with the details of the situation, but I can say that I know that Parks is the Parks Department is working with a, the co-op board. In fact, they were just on a site visit the other day. Right, um, I was there. <laughs> wonderful. So I know that there are discussions ongoing. Again, I'm I, you know we would have to have someone from the Parks Department answer your question more specifically, but um, but I know that they are they are engaged with the with the board and working on this with them. Right. So what is your interaction uh, and relationship? What's the coordination? Who has the responsibility? Is it specifically parks or do you have some part to play in this as well? Um, at, at this time, parks department is taking the lead. And will they report to you and will their plans be, who reviews whatever parks department comes up with as their uh, solution to this problem? Who says, yes, this is the right thing. Yes, this is as far as we need to go. Who does that? Um, again, council member, I'm, I'm not um, familiar with the specifics of the situation. The parks department definitely does not report to me. They will coordinate with the mayor's office of climate resiliency as needed, um, but they, they report to the deputy mayor um, of housing and economic development, Vicki Bean. I, 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 I don't know enough about the specifics to answer your question more specifically. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, council member. Uh, at this point, there are no other council member questions. So we can uh, turn back. Uh, we can turn back to the chairs for more questions if they have any. Uh, Chair Brannon, Chair Vallone. Chair Vallone, you have anything? Well, I think I think you can hear from the council members' questions I've, that where we started off with when EDC does determine that repairs are required and then hands that off to an agency to actually do the work, budget the work, prioritize the work and get it done. Um, I, I think pretty adamantly that that has to be a, a pretty much a secondary bill that Justin and I are gonna put in um, to get that information because I don't, I don't really think it's acceptable that an agency can go off and determine after it's been already found that the work needs to be done that now it's being handled off the parks or someone else who has that particular property and more from the not as parks um, and in what they're doing there and how they're going to be resilient. I, I, I would like maybe some conversation about, there are clearly districts that are waterfront districts to the city. There are council members that have no shoreline. There are council members that are surrounded by shoreline. Um, for the for the boroughs and the shoreline projects that you are targeting, is there a list of definable shoreline projects by borough that we could go over that have been determined that are about to go forward or are going forward? I, and I'll let Prince uh, clarify if this is incorrect, but it, I, certainly we could sort the list of projects, um, you know, by borough so that you could see. I also just want to make sure that we're, you know, sort of disaggregating two sets of things that we're working on. One are some of the resiliency projects that we were speaking about earlier, but also the general inspection program, which is about, you know, the general state of good repair. Well, yeah, and that general state, that those are things that we might be able to, because the other part of this that we haven't discussed and, and something that Chair Brennan and I have talked about in past hearings, you know, if there are any now present or future zoning, rezoning or development projects, um, there has been a 100% a cry to make sure that any project that touches waterfronts automatically must preserve the shoreline for community access. And, and that's something that's a much larger topic, but it's also something that, um, we haven't discussed as untouched city owned land that still can be developed. Do we have uh, an estimate or a breakdown on remaining city land that's in our portfolio that is uh, yet to be developed? 
Um, I, I don't have that in front of me as it relates to our properties, although the properties that EDC manages um, and that's in our portfolio typically are active properties. But to your point about creating additional community access, it certainly is one of our priorities when we are redeveloping, for example, our waterfront properties in the Sunset Park District. We've been working closely with Council Member Menchaca on this to make sure that whenever we're making investments, we're also creating um, you know, beautiful uh, publicly accessible open space. So for example, we opened up a new waterfront space at the Brooklyn Army Terminal in 2018. Uh, Councilmember Browning may be familiar with it, uh, as well as our new plans um, at Bush Terminal will also have significant improvements to public waterfront access. So it's certainly front of mind for us. Um, I would also refer to you know, city planning's work on the waterfront revitalization program, as well as all of the work that they're doing um, you know, around the comprehensive waterfront plan. Um, you know, they're, they're, they are, they are uh, what I would say, our experts uh, in, in the sort of the shore, soft shoreline question, um, as well as, as some of the, the questions you're having about how it impacts future, uh, you know, property development and rezoning. But Julie, with those success stories, with those type of projects, is that something that's just negotiated or is that something that's mandated or required that, that must be it, done? It's something that we have prior, I mean, so... Obviously, when there is new development on the waterfront, there are certain requirements when it comes to um, getting your DOB approvals as it relates to zoning. So certain properties have requirements uh, when they're being developed. There's also certain improvements that we're making because we hear from the community that they're important, um, even when we're not doing necessarily redevelopment, but we're just investing in certain properties, we are making sure that we're both compliant um, with whatever the zoning is for the, the waterfront zoning for the area when it applies, as well as um, you know other ways we want to be good neighbors and our public assets. Well, that's been something we've been toying with for years is making that a requirement that all shoreline access must be preserved for community uh, access, whether it's through parkland, through paving, through, through, through paths, through shoreline resiliency programs. Um, through these individual projects, it's been negotiated, but I still think that may be something we look into. Yeah, and you, I, I imagine you're familiar with the waterfront zoning requirements, but you know that when at, those often apply, uh, and not in all cases, but it often applies um, when we're reinvesting, uh, you know, either publicly or privately. So, I mean, Justin and I, you, you talked about the Sunset Park, and that's basically the success story. But there were a couple of pro uh, projects that Chair Brennan mentioned quickly, but I, I don't know if we we got the answer. Is the Hunts Point still in a development phase, or are we beyond that? So the, our Hunts Point properties, um, for the most part, are, are properties that have been built out and have been built out since the 60s or 70s. There are certain um, individual properties, like I just mentioned, the, the Grow NYC project uh, that will be new construction. Um, but for the most part, we have long-term leases with tenants along the waterfront. Um, you know, and any, any building level improvements that we're talking about are in connection with the existing tenants on the lot. No, I, of course they're talking about the, 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 either the tenants that are negotiating leases or the land that needs to be uh, post Sandy looked at, not the, the 50 years in the past. I'm sorry, the, the projects with the ongoing lease tenant holders, are we beyond development phase for the resiliency projects there? Because we had a separate hearing about that and there was lots of things to be negotiated between each lease and tenant and a lot of that had to deal with the recovery and the resiliency of the land that, that Hunts Point is on. So I think I highlighted earlier the specific projects that we're moving forward with in the short term, primarily around um, the, you know, the HESCO bags that are at, at the meat market to protect that. Um, immediate risk. And then we're also applying for that FEMA grant that will have building level improvements. Um, but, you know, we, for the most part, the opportunities with each of the tenants, uh, as I'm sure they said in the last hearing, are locked into individual leases that have quite a bit of turn left on them. Um, and so, you know, as we negotiate new development projects, we're looking at with it towards an eye towards building hardening and coastal resiliency, um, which apply differently depending on the location um, of each of those buildings. Well, a lot of that with the food distribution center had to do with power and the generation of new power or existing power. That's right. So these, is, has there been any dis decision on that on uh, the backup power generation? <laughs> So there's a couple of different components of the project, um, which are in various stages of implementation. For example, the Hunts Point um, meat market has a generator project um, that council member Salamanca has been a strong component of. Um, those uh, generators just need, are, are just awaiting EPA inspection before they can be finalized and connected, but those are basically in place pending that regulatory uh, approval from, oh, sorry, not the, um, the, the EPA approval um, inspection, I suppose. 
Um, the, we are in design on some of the other projects as it relates to the tri-generation facility and the other solar that's components of the, the long-term plan. So can you can you provide, I guess, an update on that timeline for us on those? Because that's something we've been working with. Yep, so we're still looking towards the um, the CDBG um, uh, timeline that Janie had referenced earlier. All right, and then the last thing I'll, I'll kind of wrap up is just maybe what, and we always talk about the tools in the EDC toolkit. Uh, part of the bill that we're, we're hopefully gonna be passing soon in intro 1679 is the use of living shorelines and natural based resources. So what, could you give us an example of some of what EDC is doing now with some of the shoreline projects that are starting to implement some of these alternative living resources that we can use as the identifiable first, identifiable first uh, batch of living resources that we can use and what are some of the goals that maybe we can look forward to in the future? Yeah, so let me take a first pass at that and then I'll hand it over to Prince. Many of the properties that we are working on um, are obviously active projects, right? So we have waterfront infrastructure like many of our ports. So all of the investments that we're making, for example, at SBMT are for active port use. Uh, so always trying to balance, obviously, active bulkhead use. Um, we do have a project at Hallett's Cove. Um, which uh, is an example of that uh, planting wetlands. And we also have work that we're doing, um, uh, sorry, planting wetlands and also doing cleanup. Um, and obviously you're familiar with some of the work that we're doing um, in, in Staten Island uh, for the, the, the wetlands um, project at Sawmill Creek. Um, and we, you know, I also want to sort of strongly reference the work that our, our partners at City Planning have been doing on this topic more generally. They have um, quite a bit of expertise on living shorelines and the recommendations as it relates to um, implementing them across the city. Um, and then I'll also just reference uh, work that we did at Bush Terminal Pierce Park in 2014 to implement um, the, the natural landscaping there, which had uh, be, been on a previous dumping ground. Uh, I don't know, if, Prince, if there's anything else you want to mention in terms of the work that your team is doing. No, I, I think that's pretty comprehensive, Julie. The only thing I would add is that um, uh, many of those projects were a direct result of some of the work that one went into that you know, stems from the management tool and also from the uh, or engineering team that, go, <clears throat> that goes to different sites and perform the actual inspection to determine, you know, what can or what cannot happen in each site. Is there a requirement on on the when we're talking about a, a project of a shoreline nature, whether it's preservation or repair, is there a requirement that alternative resources or living resources or alternative green approach is taken for that current project or, or is that just done on a project by project basis? I mean, a, a lot of this is, is new ground and a lot of it's exciting new, uh, and a lot of we're learning is from partners, whether it's our coastal preservation partners, whether it's our federal partners, um, they're learning more things every day on coastal preservation, whether it's the Billion Oyster Project or uh, using a, a, the seagrass to preserve the shorelines and making sure that DEP is not dumping could directly right on to a preservation project where those uh, sewer lines are going. There's so much city interagency on what happens on any particular project. And I, I think we would have a little bit more comfort if we knew that there was a, a controlling agency to make sure that approvals are done and that, that the best or the least impactful approach is made. Is, does that happen now through EDC? There's a project that's handed off to another agency to be done on a shoreline. Are they at their complete discretion to finish and complete that project or do they have to obtain permission for what approach they're going to take? So I'd like to just reference the, um, the work that city planning does on the waterfront revitalization program. Those requirements, um, uh, that, those, that program requires that the applicant look at a soft shoreline when it's not an active maritime edge. Um, and again, I'll just reference city planning as sort of our um, experts doing a deep dive on uh, making good guidelines and specific requirements in this area. Does city planning then report back to you on an annual or, or quarterly basis on what projects that they are then outlining to you for shore preservation? So, sorry, just as a, as a let me clarify what I mentioned. The, there are you know requirements that are in place through various you know policies and requirements, whether it's zoning or other guidelines that are required um, through the development process. And so those are the guidelines that EDC or other cities uh, agencies or other private developers will reference when they're doing new investment. So well, it's not on a case by case basis, but rather there are, you know, there are guidelines and structures in place that um, require the applicants to look at soft shoreline sort of when it's on an active maritime edge. 
Well, I think to our coach, we just found another bill that we can put in to work together with on uh, any projects that are shoreline based to be required to record back and report back as to what shore resiliency measures are being installed or instilled or approved or looked at uh, before the project goes forward. Because it seems to me that there's um, on the projects that are the successes that you're working with are, are clear, but then there's a lot of projects that are being handed off uh, to other agencies to maintain with other requirements. And I'm not quite sure if I'm comfortable with understanding. Yeah, and I would also say it's a little bit beyond my area of expertise, but it's probably worth looking at what the reporting requirements already exist uh, as it relates to getting certain building permits and other approvals, because I know that there's quite um, an infrastructure in place uh, in order for different approvals uh, before you actually start any of that work. And I, I imagine that some of that is, is already being captured um, through some of those processes. Well, thank you for answering the questions that we've come up with. I know Chair Brennan has some for himself. I'd like to turn it back over to my co-chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, I wanted to allow uh, Council Member Barron. I think she had another question. Yes, yes. Thank you, Chair Brennan, and thank you, Chair Valone. Um, I do have another question. In 2019, after many millions of dollars that the city put into the Pennsylvania and the Fountain Avenue landfills, the state came uh, sort of late to the game and put on a lot of the uh, icing and put in some paths and had a grand, reop a grand opening of the Shirley Chisholm State Park. So my question is for that shoreline of that area between basically Pennsylvania Avenue and Fountain Avenue, Who's responsible for that? And is there any coordination between the city and the state for uh, plans for maintaining that shoreline, that coastline, and perhaps having other kinds of community access to the water? I'm not sure that EDC has the answer to that question. Jenny, I'm not sure if MOR does. No, it sounds like a Parks Department question. So we don't know who's responsible? I know, I think the state has leased it from the feds where it's a part of the Jamaica Bay area, but I wanted to know what's the city's um, role in this, coordination, suggestions, what going, because again, the city put in the millions that was necessary for the state to do the, the cosmetic topping and have a grand reopening. But I wanted to know who's responsible now that it's there and what's the coordination between those two levels of government. So. Uh, to the chairs, if we could get an answer to that, I would appreciate it. Thank you. That was it. Thank you, council member. Yeah, um, I wasn't thrilled with the preparation or the lack of preparation today. Um, um, it's it's uh, it's disappointing, um, and I agree with my co-chair today. I think there's a lot of stuff that's going to come out of this hearing as far as reporting that I think we're going to need just to um, have some accountability and and some try to inject a little urgency here. Um, you know, I think it's, you know, look, I, I think we all understand that building resilience uh, is a process. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, but I think urgency here is certainly critical. Um, because time is just not on our side. Um, and we can't wait for these hearings to get this information. Um, and then when we get to the hearings, uh, when agencies aren't prepared and we're pulling teeth to get information, um, it's just, it's disheartening, but it's also just, it's not okay. We don't have the time. And again, like I said earlier, I didn't hear anybody blaming COVID for any of this stuff. So, um, the delay in, in some of these projects and stuff that we thought uh, was going to be completed by 2021. Now that we're hearing, we're hoping we get shovels in the ground by 2021. You know, time is not on our side and protecting our, our ports and our marine terminals and our few distribution centers and making sure that we are communicating with the communities who are on the front lines of extreme weather, um, they, they can't wait for these hearings to find out this information. So we got to do better there. And if it requires us to put in more reporting bills to keep folks honest and keep folks accountable, then that's what we're going to have to do. Um, so 
I think if, you, I, if I can it, sure I think in order to get a more complete picture of many of the questions that you're asking there are many other folks working throughout the city on some of these questions, many of these projects and some of the questions that you've asked are on properties that are outside of our jurisdiction or outside of MOR's jurisdiction and so for example I'm, I'm sure that um, Parks or DEP would have a robust answer to Councilwoman Barron's question but it just you know they're, they're not here with us uh, in a speaking role today so I, I would invite um, you know more conversation with the, the, the various agencies the, the, pro the property in New York City is owned um, you know by, by a lot of different agencies and we're you know, deep, deeply knowledgeable about the ones that we're working on, um, but, you know, want to sort of give credit to where the other other agencies are involved. Okay. Um, okay, I want to acknowledge also we were joined by Councilman Ulrich. Um, and I think with that, uh, Chris, unless Councilman Vallone has anything else, we can move on to our next panel. Yes, Chair. There are no other questions from council members, so we can move on to testimony from members of the public at this point. Uh, as I said before, we'll now turn over to public testimony. I'd like to remind everyone that unlike our typical council hearings, we will be calling on individuals one by one to testify. As I stated earlier, each panelist will be given three minutes to speak. Please begin once the sergeant has started the timer and given you the cue to begin. Council members who have questions for a particular panelist should again use the Zoom raise hand function. And I will call on you after the panel. Uh, and and uh, I will then call on you to uh, ask those questions. For panelists, once your name is called, a member of our staff will unmute you and the Sergeant at Arms will give you the go ahead to begin upon setting the timer. Please wait for the Sergeant to announce that you may begin before delivering your testimony. And at this point, I'd like to call on Noam Baharov to testify, who will be followed by Andrew Rella. Hello, everybody. Uh, if it's okay with the council, we'd love to flip the order and have Andrew Rella start, and I will follow. That's that's fine, uh, Mr. Rella. Please uh, begin. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Andrew Rella, and I'm director of engineering for Econcrete, a postal engineer. Specializing in nature inclusive design, and I am joined by Noam Barov, Econcrete's Director of Public Policy and Relations. I'm also an adjunct professor at Stevens Institute of Technology and a local native New Yorker. Throughout my academic and professional career, I've co authored the NJDP Living Shoreline Engineering Guidelines, been advisory committee, committee member for Hudson River Sustainable Shorelines Project for over 10 years, as well as worked at the DEC since 2013 on developing solutions for ecological engineering of concrete pile encasements. Econcrete, a company specializing in the ecological design of coastal and marine infrastructure, has been operating in New York City since 2012 with projects at Brooklyn Bridge Park, Reynolds Island, Huron Street, Queens, and soon to be constructed living breakwater project planned for the southern shore of Staten Island, New York, my home borough. We've heard throughout this meeting the importance of our city's waterfronts and infrastructure. Towards this effort, the importance of developing resilient infrastructure cannot be overstated. Current infrastructure needs, sea level rise, and increased storm frequency can only be addressed through assessing the structural, ecological, and social aspects of design. Nature includes design, engineering, nature, living shore lines, not only serve to provide ecosystem services and ecological uplift would serve to reinforce the structural components of the infrastructure, enhancing project lifespan, naturally adapting to climate change, expediting permitting and providing on-site mitigations, all returning an investment and saving millions of dollars. I now hand this over to Noam Barov to finish the statement. Thank you, Andrew. As my colleague, Dr. Andrew Rella mentioned, Econcrete's resilience building roots in New York City run deep. Members of the committee, Chair Brennan and Chair Malone, we thank you for the opportunity to share a concrete testimony in support of this bill. Intro 1679 affords a comprehensive and visionary approach to sustainable development throughout New York City's shoreline protection structures. By assessing the current state of the city's shoreline protection me measures and identifying where protection infrastructures must be replaced, this bill ensures a proactive approach to reducing the impacts of seasonal flooding, erosion, and catastrophic storms. By analyzing if the living shorelines approach would be a feasible replacement for traditional protections, the proposed committee would direct, the proposed bill, my apologies, would directly increase ecosystem services like flood attenuation and shelter for species while increasing coastal public access and open space. 
by determining opportunities for environmental concrete, the city is taking an integral step towards meeting the challenge of climate change. This bill would strengthen the city's work to build protected shorelines that can also be carbon sinks, marine habitat, local job creation, and recreational and educational sites. When environmental concrete is encouraged, the city gains more natural spaces and hardened infrastructure with co-benefits that traditional concrete protections cannot afford. We thank this committee for hearing our testimony and are grateful for your time and attention towards this hearing process. We look forward to continuing collaborating with the city of New York towards a more resilient future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker will be Sar Sarah Doherty, who will be followed by Michael DeLong, who is our last registered speaker. Time starts now. Hello. Okay, you can hear me. Um, thank you for having me. I'm Sarah Doherty from the Waterfront Alliance. Um, the 525 the 520 miles of shoreline in New York City are a magical landscape of maritime recreation, a working port, and a green ecological wonder. At the same time, the many mixed uses along the shoreline paint a complicated picture. Public facilities alone include the Manhattan and Brooklyn cruise terminals, the Red Hook Container Terminal, city marinas, FDMY, and NYPD marine facilities, shoreline and beaches, coastal resiliency structures, waterfront parks, greenways, and dredging sites. We recommend the city council's, we commend the city council's efforts to draw attention to port safety and resiliency in today's hearing. The city through plans like the NYC comprehensive waterfront plan, Great NYC and the EDC's waterfront management maintenance uh, system that we've discussed a lot today, as well as recent changes in the city's zoning code through the zoning for coastal flood resiliency have put forth many proposals for strengthening maritime ports and coastal resiliency. Key questions to consider from this point are, how these plans integrate or cross-reference one another and what we can do to measure progress when these recommendations are made or reforms are instituted. Three things could be improved. Interagency coordination, measuring progress and maintenance needs over time, a commitment from the administration to back the collective vision for port resiliency and sustainability across the city. The role of the city and region's ports are sometimes shrouded in a mystery for the public and, for the public and lawmakers. The port and maritime sector is and can be even greater in this 21st century economic driver while rising to meet the critical needs of local environmental justice communities. We applaud the recent efforts by the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey to deploy, a more, clean, to deploy more clean vehicles at Red Hook terminals and we commend the city's effort to create a marine terminal at Hunts Point. But a broader vision for maritime ports and the working waterfront in the city is absent. We recently published recommendations in the Waterfront Resilience Platform for the next mayor of New York City, which include prioritizing, first, a focus on five borough green maritime port vision, i.e. offshore wind, decarbonization, electrification, ecological restoration, a thriving five borough ferry service, retaining waterfront industrial zones that foster local career pathways and green and blue jobs, and moving more goods by water. Turning to intro 1679, Waterfront Alliance supports the goal of living of studying shoreline protection structures and advancing natural shoreline protections. Living or nature-based nature shorelines stabilize the shoreline and provide habitat restoration, ecosystem services, wave attenuation, improve water quality, and facilitate recre recreational activities like kayaking. Compared to conventional hardened or gray shoreline stabilization methods, living in nature-based shorelines provide 25, up to 25% more biodiversity and can reduce tidal energy, filter and reduce- um, you can finish was, up there. That's fine. <laughs> you can finish up. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll try to make it quick. Um, so we strongly support living shorelines. Um, Waterfront Alliance, through its Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines rating system, recently verified a cement plant in the South Bronx for its innovative design at the water's edge, which restored wetlands and created public access, even alongside an industrial waterfront site. To that end, we recommend that legislation include specific language on First, whether the city's existing shoreline protections align with best practices outlined in the Waterfront Edge Design Guidelines, specifically Category 3, Edge Resilience Credits and Appendix B, Shoreline Stabilization and Decision Making. That this legislation incorporate a citywide rating system or scoring system for waterfront edge resilience and ecology aligned with WEDGE. And lastly, that incentives such as expedited, 
expedited permitting between DEC, Army Corps, and Department of City Planning are in place to encourage widespread adoption of naturalized shorelines. Thanks for the opportunity to testify today and apologies for going over time. And Sarah, thanks for making it waiting to the end. And we always love looking forward to your reports uh, and working with your alliance. It's so important. And I know Chair Brennan and I are, are gonna be right on the heels of some new bills after this. So <laughs> you, may be, uh, you may see some of your wording right in those bills. So we're all on the same mission here. Thank you. Thank you. Our next and last registered speaker is Michael Dulong. Please begin. Time starts now. Uh, please, once, please hold on one second. I think we have to just unmute you. There, I think you can hear me now, right? Yes, yes we can. Great point. Thanks. Great point, Sarah. Good afternoon, Chairman Vallone, Chairman Brennan, um, and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I'm going to testify in support of 1679. Um, and thank you for your leadership in pursuing a, a study of all 520 miles of New York's shoreline. Um, we believe, I want to talk about why we believe it's necessary and respectfully suggest some ways to strengthen the bill. Um, I, in all of your remarks today, it's very clear climate change is something that is going to grow worse. We're already seeing sunny day flooding, uh, especially out in Queens. Uh, we're seeing an increase in localized flooding uh, in streets and homes due to precipitation, increased combined sewer overflows, and an increased risk of storm surge. Um, in your remarks today, uh, Council Member Brennan, uh, you talked about the, the $19 billion that Sandy cost the city and just damages. Uh, 43 New Yorkers died, um, 433,000 New Yorkers homes are in the floodplain were affected by Sandy. Uh, so many of those are low income New Yorkers and uh, people of color. And so clearly something needs to be done to prevent that from happening again and the problem is growing worse. The federal study that is happening now, the Harbors and Tributaries study is not going to account for all of these problems, for all these, for all of sea level rise impacts. It is focused only on storm surge and does not address blue sky flooding or flooding that will occur due to rising tides. Uh, and so New York City needs its own plan that will either complement the federal government's plan if the federal government ever acts or will step in and um, act where the federal government won't. Um, and so a few ways that we think you could strengthen the bill. First, uh, resiliency planning is obviously very complex and the people and communities know exactly where they are vulner vulnerable. They know where flooding happens regularly. They know um, where the solutions might be and what those solutions might be and would be able to push for those. Uh, so we think there needs to be not just community participation, but community leadership in devising these plans. And we hope the bill would set forth a framework to allow for that. And as general community engagement doesn't also doesn't always result in equitable participation. Um, we think that there should be a, a racial equity guideline spelled out in the bill. Um, now, obviously, some a lot of planning has taken place. EDC talked about it today. Uh, Southern Manhattan has gotten the, the lopsided majority of that planning. And, uh, and some of it's great planning. We just want this study to, and the resources of the study to go to places where there hasn't been that type of planning. So I hope that the efforts that have already been done would not be duplicated, but that they could be incorporated. Um, and that includes all of the studies that EDC is doing of it, oh, uh, what the city owns. Uh, I just have two more things to say, if that's all right. Go ahead, Michael. Um, and so of the one third of the city that's owned privately, we're already seeing developers uh, wanna put in their own piecemeal um, structures. So I'm speaking specifically about the two trees, the ring project in Williamsburg. Um, I'm, we haven't taken a position on that, but we want, if we're going to build in the waters, we wanna build one time, we wanna get it right. We wanna protect the communities, not just one building. So we do need a plan for that other third. And the last, of course, we appreciate and support the living shorelines or the, the preference for living shorelines um, as the best way to protect communities, protect ecology. One point um, that we're concerned about is that we cannot build ourselves 
out of this problem completely. And there will be some need for strategic retreat. We hope that the report and the study will be able to identify those areas, identify where that might be necessary as a potential solution so that we can have those on paper and actually begin those conversations. So thank you very much. Uh, and we support the bill and we appreciate your, uh, your support for this study. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. Uh, at this point, Mr. DeLong was our last registered speaker. If we have inadvertently missed anyone who has registered to testify today and has yet to have been called, please use the Zoom raise hand function and you'll be called in the order that your hand has been raised. S seeing none, I will turn it over uh, back over to Chair Brandon and Chair Vallone to make any closing remarks and to adjourn the hearing. Thank you, Chris. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I think this, I think we learned a lot today. I think we got a lot of ideas for stuff we need to do to hold folks accountable. Um, and again, I, um, you know, we shouldn't have to wait for these hearings to get updates that aren't um, as satisfactory as we'd like to hear. Um, I certainly um, would hope that the agencies share our urgency a little bit more. Um, you know, Earth Day is great, but Earth Day is every day. Um, time is not on our side here in any of these projects. And thinking really about the communities that are on the front lines of uh, extreme weather is what keeps us up at night. Um, and I, but I do think that some more reporting would help uh, as far as accountability is concerned on some of these updates. I think today some of the agencies were not nearly as prepared as they should have been. Unfortunately, that's not new with some of these hearings, but we don't let that discourage us. We let that inspire us to do better, to come up with some legislation to hold these folks accountable. So, um, but I'll, I'll turn it over to, uh, to Chair Vallone for some closing remarks, but thank you, uh, Chris, and all the committee uh, who work hard behind the scenes to make this possible. That's right, Chris this, and the team, this was a flawless hearing, so thank you. And like Chair Brennan said, uh, especially for the advocates who waited to the end. I still see you there, Michael and Sarah, and some of the folks. Uh, your your advice and words are, do hit home, and we do include, you'll see in the bills right after this, Justin and Tina and I are already working together on that. And that's why these surveys and data are so important to put into legislation, because if one thing we've learned over the last eight years together, if, if we don't, we get answers like today. So we have to put the bills in, and we have to mandate it. And uh, I, I see already what my question for the administration is going to be next week on the Capitol is going to be prioritizing this $700 million that's already been identified for shorefront capital repairs that is yet to be done. So if we're really going to put a stamp on a green future for New York City, it's got to be in the budget. We can do all the studies in the world we want, but if we don't fund it, it's not going to happen. So um, I thank everyone for that. I thank everyone for today's hearing. And I think Justin and I together, um, after celebrating Earth Day, like you said, every day is Earth Day. So with that, I think we bring our hearing to a close. And on behalf of Chair Brennan and I, myself, thank you. God bless everyone.